Welcome to this evening's installment of the National Humanities Center's Virtual Book Club. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the Center, and your host for this evening's event. I'd like to start with a poem tonight, and the poem I'm going to read by our American bard, Walt Whitman, reminds us that while we all are necessarily steeped in data and scientific reporting regarding the pandemic, it's also important to take time to immerse oneself occasionally in the wondrous and the transcendent. The poem is, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures, were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer, where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight for another thoughtful discussion. But before I introduce this evening's guest, William Cohen, I want to point out that while you'll only hear my voice and Bill's tonight, we can all participate in the conversation by using the comments section. I encourage you to pose your questions and offer your thoughts at any time. I'll be monitoring that part of the conversation and we'll bring your questions to Bill's attention. I also encourage you to respond to one another. We're being joined by people from across the country, and this is a wonderful opportunity to interact with those who share your interests. Our guest this evening is author William Cohen. Bill began his career as an investigative reporter before spending 17 years as a mergers and acquisitions banker on Wall Street. However, over the past dozen years or so, Bill has returned to his journalistic roots with a prolific and well-received output. His six books include multiple New York Times bestsellers about the inner workings of Wall Street, as well as The Price of Silence, his examination of the Duke lacrosse scandal. He's a special correspondent at Vanity Fair and a columnist for the deal book section of the New York Times, and also writes for the Financial Times, Bloomberg Business Week, The Atlantic, The Nation, Fortune, and Politico. Bill has been a regular guest on CNN, Bloomberg TV, MSNBC, and BBC TV, and has made guest appearances on a variety of programs, including The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, The News Hour, The Charlie Rose Show, The Tavis Smiley Show, and CBS This Morning. This evening, he has graciously agreed to talk with us about his most recent book, Four Friends, an account that focuses his considerable reporting skills on a much more personal subject. Please join me in welcoming National Humanities Center trustee, William Cohen. Thank you, Robert. Uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. It's great to be here with all of you and thank you for the kind introduction, Robert. As you know, I'm a big fan of the National Humanities Center and it has been an honor for me to get to know you and to serve on the board of the National Humanities Center, which is truly one of the great institutions in our country. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, Robert is kind enough to say that I would be talking tonight about my book, Four Friends, uh, the subtitle of which is Promising Lives Cut Short. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I came to write this book. As Robert pointed out, it's obviously a very different book for me. Uh, I did start as a uh, investigative reporter uh, down the road from where Robert is sitting uh, in Raleigh, uh, covering the Wake public school system uh, back in the mid eighties. Uh, and that uh, was a time of great consternation uh, in Wake County with the school system and how it was going to deal with school integration and issues as controversial as busing and 
magnet schools. Um, as a result of that uh, experience, I ended up winning two investigative reporting awards in Raleigh uh, in the two years that I was there, and then uh, decided uh, to go to business school, to go back to Columbia, go back to New York. I was a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School, and I went back to get my MBA at Columbia, thinking it would be a great idea to be an investigative reporter at the Wall Street Journal. And unfortunately, uh, that never happened. Uh, that part of my dream uh, got snuffed out. Uh, and instead, uh, in May of 1987, uh, as Robert suggested, um, I left journalism and sort of joined the crowd going to Wall Street, when all you had to do to get a job on Wall Street was to breathe. And fortunately, I was able to breathe and I got a job. Uh, and that occupied my life for the next 17 years. Uh, I started at uh, GE Capital in New York, uh, financing leverage buyouts of all things, something I knew absolutely nothing about. Uh, then got a job uh, working at Lazard in New York, uh, uh, doing restructuring work, something I knew nothing about. Uh, and then uh, was an M&A uh, advisor, uh, again, doing something I knew nothing about. Uh, but like a Florentine guild, uh, uh, Lazard was a great place to learn how to do things that I never thought I would ever do or had no aptitude for. Uh, and then I became, eventually became pretty good at it, uh, worked at Merrill Lynch, uh, then at uh, what became J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and by the time I left in 2004, I was uh, head of uh, a big uh, group in the M&A department at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, uh, covering telecom and media companies. Uh, and so after 17 years, I decided to hang up my cleats and uh, decided to go back to writing. And uh, it was both uh, very nerve wracking. I had a uh, wife and two young children. Uh, I, uh, the uh, money that you make as a writer is materially different than the money that you make uh, as a Wall Street investment banker. But uh, that was okay with me. I was, I was uh, willing to take a chance. Uh, and my first book uh, was about Lazard, uh, where I had worked, even though I never thought I'd be writing a book about it. Uh, uh, my second book was about the a collapse of uh, Bear Stearns uh, called House of Cards. Uh, third book was about Goldman Sachs uh, called Money and Power. How uh, Goldman Sachs came to rule the world. Uh, then as Robert says, uh, I began to uh, detour. Uh, everybody wanted me to write a book about, you know, Bank of America or Merrill Lynch or, you know, Bill, just keep doing what you're, you're doing. They're bestsellers, everybody likes them. Of course, that was not something that was interesting to me. Uh, once I had done that, I decided uh, it was time to do something else. And so I uh, had gone to Duke um, and the story of the Duke lacrosse scandal just fascinated me no end, uh, how this had happened, what really had happened. It was the kind of story that uh, kept shifting right before your eyes uh, from week to week captivating the nation's attention for months. Uh, and I decided to take a blank sheet of paper and uh, start at the very beginning and tried to figure out what happened. Uh, that book called The Price of Silence uh, was also a bestseller, but um, caused a lot of heartache uh, uh, at my alma mater and uh, among people who uh, have very strong feelings about what they think happened and why. and how dare somebody try to actually get to the truth of what happened. Um, I act with a book called Why Wall Street Matters, uh, sort of going back a little bit to what I had done before, uh, but really because uh, I had been uh, uh, very concerned that uh, people were using Wall Street uh, bashing for political ends and had completely lost sight of uh, the good that Wall Street does, 
Uh, yes, it does plenty of stuff that irritates people and and should should be uh, uh, corrected and should be modified. But uh, politicians were just having a field day after the financial crisis, uh, you know, using Wall Street as a as a whipping boy for all the ills of American society. Uh, I had interrupted the book for friends to write uh, the book, Why Wall Street Matters. And so, uh, you know, when I watched, you know, the first uh, National Humanities Center book event a few weeks ago with Joe Luzzi, um, who actually lives about 20 minutes away from me here up in upstate New York. Um, and he wrote about uh, how the, uh, you know, the sudden death of his wife uh, and the birth of his child uh, happening simultaneously obviously changed his life. And he uh, felt the need to uh, write about it. And he uh, very interestingly talked about how he had uh, written about it uh, first and it didn't fly with his agent who happens to be my agent. Uh, and then he wrote a book about Dante, which didn't fly with his agent, who happens to be my agent. And so then he combined them all into a book that did work and did work beautifully. Um, so his need to write about loss uh, uh, came about nearly instantly. Uh, my need to write about loss and the fragility of life uh, came about uh, uh, much more subtly and over a very long period of time. In fact, I don't even know really what possessed me to do this. Um, I've been asked, and so I've thought about it. And so as I've thought about it, I, I realized that, uh, you know, believe it or not, sort of death has always been kind of lurking in the background of my life, not in any major way. Uh, you know, I had a first cousin who uh, I live next door to, uh, and our families live next door to, uh, and, you know, he died as, a, as an infant, and, you know, it's not somebody, it's not like I really, you know, he didn't live long enough for anybody to know really who he was, but nevertheless, suddenly he was here, and then he was not here. I had another first cousin who was uh, a, a, a girl who was about eight years old, who also died of uh, from uh, disease uh, unexpectedly. And so th those were two, again, I don't wanna dwell on that in any way because you know it didn't affect my rather idyllic life growing up in central Massachusetts and then going to Andover uh, and you know the rest of the, the career that I talked about. But um, I think it was sort of seeping into the DNA of the way I thought about things. Uh, and then, you know, at the school that I went to, a very small school uh, outside of, in Boylston, Massachusetts, growing up, that had actually uh, been a farm, uh, and there were about 10 kids in each grade, not in each class, but in each grade. It was a very, obviously, a very small school, and um, it w went from being sort of a, a strict 1950s-style school to a very sort of uh, liberal hippy dippy 1960s style school, uh, and there were two uh, uh, classmates of mine uh, who also died suddenly. One uh, uh, was crazy enough to uh, actually uh, go uh, climbing telephone poles to uh, get glass insulators uh, off the top of the telephone poles, and you know, once upon a time. Glass insulators were made of clear green glass, uh, were actually very beautiful and artistic and very differentiated. Now, of course, there are these sort of brown ceramic things that are at the top of the poles if you look at them. But back then there were these collectible items and this guy, Brad Morrison, uh, would go up, believe it or not, on these poles and collect them. Uh, and then one day, uh, he fell off the pole and got electrocuted, and that news got conveyed to us, uh, you know, at school, this very small school, uh, and had a big impact. Uh, there was another, uh, then the next year, a guy named uh, John Holmes uh, was coming to school uh, with his mother, and somehow their car got stopped on the train.
pass and train them in a parish in that accident. And that also was a stunning moment uh, at my school. So uh, there was a award uh, at the school named for a kid named Bruce Armstrong, who, and by, by the way, I, I don't mean to be you know, macabre, especially at a time like this, but these, these are the, the things that, you know, infiltrate your life as you're growing up. And Bruce Armstrong got hit in the head with a, bat, a baseball bat, but he was a Christian scientist. So his parents didn't believe in using medical care. So uh, he ended up dying and there was a award named after him. So they were like, you know, the, the two members of my family and then these three kids, one, two of whom I know, one of them I didn't, uh, but there was an award named after that sort of started seeping into my DNA. So I was sort of subliminally, I guess, aware of the difference between life and death. Um, and then sort of, you know, I went to Andover I went to Duke, uh, continued my life, uh, and uh, I began to hear stories uh, uh, of and hear the fact of that some of my classmates uh, from Andover who had died young and tragically, and I sort of made a mental note of of them and their circumstances, and uh, uh, you know one who, you know, and I ended up, of course, writing about them in this book, one named Jack Berman, who uh, uh, was uh, uh, like me, uh, uh, had grown up uh, uh, Jewish, and uh, I was from central Massachusetts. He was from uh, uh, north uh, central uh, Connecticut, uh, literally just a half hour south of where I grew up. Uh, his uh, family were his parents were Holocaust survivors. Uh, they had um, uh, managed. To, they met in a a, a camp uh, uh, after the war uh, in a refugee camp. Uh, uh, were fortunate enough to get a boat to New York City. Uh, were living in the Bronx, getting paid like a dollar an hour to do stitching clothing, uh, and then uh, were encouraged by a rabbi who thought that it was very important that Jews moved out of the city. They were encouraged to move to rural Connecticut where they became egg farmers. And uh, uh, they spoke no English. Uh, uh, Jack grew up with his parents being egg farmers, speaking Yiddish. Uh, and uh, he had an older brother who was 10 years older, uh, who was actually born in the refugee camp, who basically raised Jack, um, taught him English, uh, but he was still being encouraged to be a rabbi. Uh, and uh, then his brother decided that that, uh, you know, and he was going to be a rabbi in rural Connecticut, if you can believe it, uh, where there really weren't uh, many Jews or many rabbis. Uh, and his older brother, who's now a lawyer in Boston, decided that that was not the life uh, for his brother, who he deemed was brilliant. Somehow, uh, even though the admissions process had stopped, uh, got him uh, to Andover uh, after the admissions cycle uh, on a half scholarship. Uh, and he uh, uh, got to Andover and uh, then Brown and then became a lawyer. Uh, the second uh, friend uh, who I wrote about, uh, a guy named Will Daniel, uh, who was the grandson of Harry Truman, this is obviously much more typical of the kind of guy uh, who was at Andover. Uh, his father uh, was Clifton Daniel, uh, the managing editor of the New York Times. His mother was Margaret Truman Daniel, the only child of the Trumans. Uh, he grew up in a triplex on Park Avenue, um, went to St. Bernard's private school in New York uh, and went to Andover, of course, uh, uh, but spent his whole life uh, and then Yale, uh, and spent his whole life running from his family uh, legacy, his family experience. He obviously could have used his family connections to do whatever he wanted to do, and he chose uh, to, to not go into politics. He chose not to go into journalism, even though he may well have had aptitude for both of those, uh, and he decided that his calling was to really help people uh, and help homeless people, help homeless people vote, help homeless people uh, escape uh, 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 the AIDS epidemic. 
uh, and uh, spent uh, his life until he died uh, 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 really studying the homeless and how to make their lives better. Uh, the third uh, friend that I uh, wrote about is a guy named uh, Harry Bull, uh, who was from uh, the west side of Chicago uh, his, in Hillsdale, Chicago, uh, Illinois. Uh, his family, uh, a long time, uh, many generations of Illinois uh, residents uh, owned a uh, very big uh, paper company, uh, one of the oldest companies in uh, Chicago. Um, uh, he, uh, you know, uh, was brilliant, uh, uh, extremely high IQ, was the only person, uh, you know, I went to Andover from 1973 to 1977. You can imagine that uh, it was filled with uh, liberal uh, people, uh, liberal-minded people uh, like me. Uh, Harry was the first person and progressive types, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, assimilate the 60s experience into a private school uh, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Harry was the first person I ever met who was more conservative politically, but, but brilliant and open-minded. Um, uh, uh, was so smart, uh, actually, that he sort of uh, placed out of every class of school that he was in, uh, was going to go to Andover uh, when he was like barely 13, uh, but he had to take a, a year, an interim year uh, at, an, at another private school uh, before he could go to Andover. Uh, and I was always the youngest uh, person. I, I went to Andover in ninth grade. I was the youngest person in our, in our class until Harry came along in 10th grade, and then he was the youngest person. Uh, uh, he went to uh, uh, Yale for a semester, dropped out, took a year off, eventually went to Northwestern and University of Chicago Law School. Uh, the fourth uh, person, obviously, we all know is it's uh, John F. Kennedy Jr., who, of course, uh, needs uh, no introduction, but, um, you know, I was determined uh, in this book to share with people a very different kind of uh, uh, narrative about John, who uh, was not only uh, my dorm mate, uh, uh, I was his advisor uh, when he came to the school as, in his third year as a, well, we called them uppers, but we, most people call them junior years. Uh, he came, he came from, uh, you know, uh, in school in New York. Uh, and uh, I sort of mentored him uh, that first year before I graduated uh, and got to know him in uh, ways that, you know, most people don't if they just read tabloids. But um, I was, you know, very determined um, in each case. You know, I basically only knew the basic fact of, uh, their deaths. Uh, I really didn't even know uh, how uh, actually in many cases they had died uh, or what led up to that. I didn't really know uh, really what much about them after they left Andover because it was a time uh, before uh, there were smartphones, before the internet. I don't know if anybody can believe that. It was a time before we could use Zoom and have Facebook uh, book chats. Uh, it was a time where, uh, you know, there were no cell phones. Once you lost touch with people and went about your way, on your way, unless you uh, wrote letters to each other, which, you know, most guys don't write letters to each other, unless you had somebody's payphone in their dorm at college, you really couldn't keep in touch with them. So, I mean, there were times when I would be living in New York City and people I'd gone to Andover with were literally living, you know, a few blocks away, and I didn't know it. Um, so uh, it was, again, not unlike the uh, uh, book about uh, Duke and the lacrosse scandal where I had to take a blank sheet of paper and figure out what had happened. This was, again, an opportunity for me to write, obviously, a much more personal book, uh, but using the same investigative journalism skills that I you know, take pride in and wanted to continue to hone while telling a very different story. So I had to 
if you can imagine uh, uh, this, Robert, uh, uh, go and and talk to uh, you know Jack Berman's widow and Harry Bull's widow. Uh, uh, you know, Will Daniel wasn't married. Uh, you know, John died with his wife, obviously, but talk to the widows of these guys. They didn't know me. Uh, they didn't, you know, and this was something that had happened basically 20 plus years before and asking them to revisit these very difficult stories. Uh, 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 the widows talking to me and I met with them and in their, in their homes and they not only were gracious about sharing with me uh, the stories and the circumstances of their husband's lives, but you know, the, the, the circumstances of their deaths. And I did the same thing with, you know, Will's family members and John's friends and uh, my, all of, you know, a number of these people were mutual friends. Um, so it was both an intellectual and an investigatory uh, challenge. Um, it was, you know, unbelievably sad at times, uh, unbelievably moving. Uh, but I, I felt that uh, I needed to um, sort of get this out of my system uh, and to honor their uh, their lives by uh, uh, re-connecting uh, with their family members and telling the stories of how they lived and, you know, the tragic uh, ways in which they died. I mean, n none of them died uh, from health-related issues. They all died... Um, uh, from tragic uh, events that obviously none of them uh, had anticipated uh, on the morning that they woke up. Uh, and, if, you know, that became, you know, one of the things I learned at Andover, one of the things that sort of really got um, uh, burned into my uh, DNA was sort of the, the, the philosophy of the French existentialists, which unfortunately I had to read in the original French uh, in a class um, speaking French. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, I think I got about 5% of uh, what they uh, actually wrote. Fortunately, uh, my history thesis at Duke was about, again, the French existentialists and how they had people like uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus and Simone de Beauvoir, how they had, uh, uh, their philosophies changed as a result of becoming prisoners of war during World War II. And that at least I was able to read in English. So uh, I uh, was able to, for the first time, sort of really get a sense of what they were writing about. And, and of course, one of the things they write about in tried to live their lives like was, uh, you know, thinking about what it's like, you know, if to live your life as if it were your last day and how you would live it. Now, of course, as a philosophical matter, that's easy to contemplate. As a, a, a practical matter, living day to day, you really can't live your life as if it were your last. If, it, if you were to live your life uh, every day as if it were your last, you'd be eating macaroni and cheese all day, I think, because who wouldn't want to have macaroni and cheese as their last meal? Uh, so, uh, but that was sort of the thinking that was in my mind as I was going about reporting and writing the stories of my friends, um, uh, you know, how they, you know, had just been living their lives. Jack Berman as a, as a, as a lawyer representing uh, a people who felt that they had lost their jobs unfairly uh, and, you know, were suing their employers. Uh, uh, Will Daniel, who was working with uh, homeless men, uh, uh, you know, in the northern tip of Manhattan. Uh, Harry Bull, who had become a partner at uh, Winston Strawn, a big Chicago law firm. And then in the day he'd be, he, he became a partner, he left and went back to run his family's paper business. And John Kennedy Jr., of course, who uh, at the time of his death was sort of struggling and coming to the terms with George Magazine, which he had started, uh, which wasn't going particularly well. And he was actually looking for new investors. 
and while also contemplating uh, very seriously a career in politics, uh, he had decided, uh, he had died obviously in, in August of uh, uh, at, at 19, July of 1999. Um, he had decided, uh, he had made a decision to run for Senator uh, from New York uh, in 2000. Uh, and then Hillary Clinton announced that she was moving to New York to run for senator. So being a good loyal Democrat and being close to the Clintons, he decided not to do that, not to run in that election. Uh, and then he decided instead that he was gonna run for governor of New York uh, against George Pataki in 2002. Uh, you know, I don't think it was crazy to uh, think that he might have won that and won that quite handily. And you know, if that's the case, I don't think it's crazy uh, to think that it might have been John F. Kennedy Jr. against Donald Trump in 2016, and he might be the president now uh, instead of Donald Trump. Um, that's an interesting thought. It's something I thought about a lot as I was writing this book, and it's it's something that I gleaned from many of his friends who were much closer to him in his last years than I was, uh, who told me that his, he very definitely had made the decision, especially after his mother died, uh, to, to pursue the family business, uh, especially since George wasn't going uh, you know, particularly well at that point, even though he probably was ahead of the curve in terms of the popularity of a magazine like that focused on politicians as celebrities, which I think would probably be much more popular today than it was back when he started it. Um, so I think, uh, uh, Robert, I, in many ways, uh, uh, fulfilled uh, my, my goal for this uh, book to uh, tell the stories of my uh, friends, how they, how they lived, how they got to Andover, uh, which obviously was in many very different ways. Uh, uh, how they did, what they did when they got there, what they did when they left, uh, uh, what they did as adults, how they uh, lived their lives, and then how they died, and the tragic circumstances in each case, which you will note I have not mentioned yet in this uh, conversation or this lecture, whatever it is. Uh, uh, you know, I think part of what I also tried to do in this book is not really tell people what I was up to. Uh, I, uh, you know, alluded to it. It's called Four Friends. Uh, it's called, uh, the subtitle is Promising Lives Cut Short. Uh, there are the picture of the four guys on the book uh, jacket, on the spine. Uh, but I purposefully wanted the book to unfold for people uh, not really being sure of what I'm up to here uh, to make it sort of intriguing for the reader, uh, hopefully drawn in through their, the narrative of their stories. Uh, and then you sort of come to the end and find out uh, that they have, uh, uh, he has died tragically. And then uh, the next uh, uh, segment begins. And uh, as you continue to read, you begin to get a sense of exactly uh, how this all fits together. And so it's sort of uh, uh, like uh, an existential, uh, uh, an impressionist painting, if you will, where when you're up close to it, you see uh, dots of color, but when you stand back, you see uh, a, a, you know, a painting, an image in full, or like a mosaic where you see uh, little bits and pieces of, of, of glass or ceramic or, 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 or stone uh, uh, that are colored. And then uh, when you step back, you see something much bigger and more meaningful. And so that's what I was trying to do uh, in this book, trying to um, create a, a mosaic of life and the fragility of life. And, you know, uh, obviously uh, when this book came out last July, uh, uh, People really weren't focused on such things. Uh, uh, when this book came out last July, 
uh, since it wasn't about Donald Trump or anything to do with Donald Trump, uh, you know, it uh, uh, unfortunately didn't have the kind of uh, impact that I was hoping for it to have. But I think obviously in our current circumstances, uh, it's, uh, you know, I think a lot more relevant, uh, uh, poignant, uh, and sort of the, the thin blue line between uh, life and death that, uh, you know, we're literally facing every day now um, and, and in such a mysterious, uh, invisible way, um, I think makes this story about four of my uh, friends uh, from Andover uh, more relevant and poignant. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not about uh, 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 people of color. It's, it's not about, uh, uh, you know, many, you know, these, these are people who were basically fortunate in their lives as I have been. Uh, and, and yet, you know, that doesn't make them any less human or their stories any less interesting or relevant. Um, I think it's something we all can absolutely relate to. So, um, you know, Robert, you can feel free to ask questions or if you think there's something you'd like me to expound on before the questions, I'm happy to do that too. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Um, very, very powerful. So that let me go to some of the questions that have come up. Um, one questioner asks about, did you recognize how extraordinary these men were as classmates or was that an understanding that came to you later as you viewed their, their lives in retrospect? You know, and I, I, I don't mean this in, uh, you know, any kind of arrogant uh, way, but I mean, Andover was a very special place, uh, obviously, by nature of its history, it's the oldest American uh, prep school, high school. Uh, uh, it has got, uh, a, you know, unbelievable physical plant. Uh, it has, you know, I think I start the book by talking about only one high school in America has graduated, been, been the, school, the high school for two American presidents. In this case, it happens to be George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. Uh, but it really was an extraordinary place. And, and the teaching was phenomenal. The physical plant was exceptional. The resources were phenomenal. And honestly, to answer the question, I thought my classmates, the people I was surrounded with, I really felt privileged to be able, and not, you know, not in a economic sense, I, but in a, that I was fortunate to be in school with these people from these incredible backgrounds uh, and who just seemed so interesting and curious and fun and, and uh, challenging. And so, uh, I mean, as I, uh, you know, Will Daniel, I mean, I mean, obviously uh, he didn't go around with a, uh, a, a banner on his chest saying he was the grandson of Harry Truman, you know, his last name being Daniel. Uh, which is something obviously John Kennedy Jr. couldn't do. So obviously John Kennedy Jr. was, you know, exceptional and his arrival on campus was a big deal. But Will Daniel being the grandson of Harry Truman and the son of Clifton Daniel, I mean, you know, he, I mean, he was exceptionally smart, expe exceptionally sort of troubled and very interior and running from his pedigree, which is not something that I had ever experienced. I mean, First of all, being around New York kids, being from central Massachusetts was an eye opener in itself. Harry Bull was exceptional because he was so bright. And Jack Berman, you know, was like a version of me, only, you know, from obviously exceptionally bright, but from, uh, you know, uh, li literally as if he had stepped out of the Holocaust, uh, being the child of Holocaust survivors and growing up on an egg farm. I mean, uh, which is, and somehow making, you know, your way to Andover. Uh, uh, so I really felt privileged to be there. And I literally felt 
that the people I was with were exceptional, uh, whether they were my close friends or not. Now, obviously, it, it never would have occurred to me in a bazillion years to, to either, you know, to A, become a writer, B, to, to I mean, I was business manager of the newspaper, I wasn't a writer, uh, or, or ever to write about uh, uh, Andover or my friends. But I, I think if you look at the uh, all of my writings, uh, it, uh, there's one pattern through them all, basically, and that is I, I'm writing about the experience places that I've experienced that I kind of know firsthand. Obviously I went to Andover, I went to Duke, I worked at Lazard, I competed against Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs. I mean, it might as well have been Lazard or Merrill, it didn't matter. My new book is about uh, GE where I, you know, obviously worked after business school. So, um, you know, if, you know, Peter Lynch who ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund used to say, invest in what you know. My father always told me, that Peter Lynch said that. And so, I mean, I tend to write what I know uh, so that I think I can recreate the atmospherics, you know, from my DNA as opposed to have to rely on others. So another questioner uh, refers to your background as an investigative reporter and uh, remarks that your work has always been praised for being meticulously and thoroughly researched and that Four Friends is no exception. But she also points out that uh, it's different in that in the past you were researching business executives, politicians, people you knew of but did not necessarily know personally, and asks, can you talk more about what it was like to investigate the lives of your friends as opposed to your previous investigations? A real eye-opener, a real eye-opener. Um, you know, again, we knew each other for a very short period of time. You know, I knew John Kennedy Jr. literally for a year. Uh, Harry Bull, who wasn't in my dorm uh, for, you know, three years or two and a half. Uh, uh, Jack Berman was two years ahead. I knew him for a year, year and a half. Uh, Will Daniel was in my dorm, but then, you know, moved to a different dorm and sort of I knew him for the year that we were together. So. I knew them, and of course, I would know them to see them on campus because, you know, it was 1,200 kids, but it was actually extremely collegial, and uh, 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 you know, there were cliques, of course, and different circles, but people were always very friendly, and it was a very ecumenical uh, place. Uh, but to then go back and literally recreate their lives. Uh, uh, and you know, with John Kennedy Jr., it was, you know, relatively easy. I mean, uh, Carolyn Kennedy did not help me in any way, as you wouldn't, you would have expected she wouldn't have. Uh, but it, it didn't matter because you know everybody felt like they felt like they knew John, uh, John, John. Uh, you know, he was probably the most famous human being in our country. Uh, he's the only person who was uh, ever born to a president elect. He grew up literally from the age of zero to three years in the White House. I mean, that's obviously never happened uh, before. Um, so um, he was much easier to research because there's been so much written about him. But even so, you know, but talking to his closer friends than I was, I learned an incredible amount about him that I didn't know and, you know, how he sort of he's struggled, you know, what his personal struggles were. The other three was were like literally, um, uh, you know, trying to investigate the null set. I mean, there was literally, I mean, there were a couple of New York Times stories about Will Daniel, you know, hanging out with Grandpa Truman. Uh, but beyond that, very little. And so, and, and with Harry and Jack, there was literally nothing except for stories about how they died. Um, and those tragedies. So I had to, you know, really start at the beginning uh, and found out things about them that I did not know. Uh, and that, you know, was kind of shocking to learn and not my favorite moment, moment in life to learn about them. Uh, you know, uh, mental breakdowns, uh, struggles with family, struggles with drug addiction, um, you know, things that probably are 
better left unwritten, but, you know, I had embarked on this. And, you know, one thing I believe strongly in is tell stories, you know, the men in full that they are. Not just coding it, not just the good stuff, uh, but everything. Uh, and so, you know, that got some people angry at me, as you can imagine, as all my books get people angry at me. So, okay. Um, and, you know, uh, there was a time where, you know, Andover had talked to me about coming to campus to to speak to the students there about the book. But I think once they read it and they re realized that, oh, my God, students at Andover in the 1970s were... <laughs> doing drugs and having sex, uh, you know, I think they just decided they didn't want to go there. Uh, not in the, you know, 2019, 2020 time frame. Uh, so uh, it was a real eye opener to, to learn about uh, people that I, just like it was a real eye opener to, to learn what happened in the Duke lacrosse case and what Lazard was really like, even though I'd worked there for six years and, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it was it was a very rich and rewarding experience for me, and it couldn't have happened without the the kindness and the time that people who knew my friends much better than I did uh, took to spend with me and share shared with me their stories. I mean, I just you know you can imagine being in the home of the widows of Harry Bull and Jack Berman and having them relive these tragic events. Um, it's quite moving. So another question asked to pick up on, on what, the, what, you're, what you're speaking of, uh, how did the families of these individuals respond to the finished book? And were you at all surprised by their responses? Uh, the, 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 it, so it ranged from um, uh, the family of Jack Berman uh, uh, being uh, very, very pleased with the portrait. Uh, you know, he was probably a straighter arrow, so there was probably less controversy there. Um, I heard nothing, even though I had spent many hours with Will Daniels' brothers and many of his friends uh, basically heard, uh, I heard from a few of his friends, they thought it was incredible, but I did not hear from uh, Will's brothers. Obviously his parents are no longer alive. Uh, obviously I did not hear from Carolyn Kennedy. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the response from uh, the Harry Bull family was very strong, very positive too, but you know, again, I revealed things about Harry that most people didn't know. Uh, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, but, you know, he struggled uh, in his senior year at Andover. He struggled mightily in his first and only semester at Yale. And so there were like two years there where he was sort of in a bit of a drug-induced fog. Uh, moved back to Chicago, got his act together, you know, went to Northwestern, graduated top of his class at Chicago Law School, you know, University of Chicago Law School, and was off to the races. So, um, but, you know, I was fortunate to have, to have letters that they, they had written to their friends and their family members that had been saved. I mean, it was really an incredible uh, treasure trove that I, you know, and it didn't have to be that way. It could have been, uh, you know, could have been much more difficult. Uh, uh, and I, I also want to just say that I, um, I tell the story of a fifth friend uh, in the book, uh, a guy named uh, uh, David Buck, who was in my class, whose personal story was also incredible that I researched. And his father uh, was a young professor at MIT working on the first computers uh, and also died uh, very young at the age of 32 when David was three months old. Um, uh, uh, some people think the Russians poisoned him because he was working on state secrets. Other people think he died of pneumonia. I think the MIT cover story was he died of pneumonia, but 
the conspiracy theory is he died of uh, uh, at the result of Soviet uh, poisoning. Uh, but he, you know, he he was one of the first people to uh, work on computers. Um, uh, uh, and he and another friend of mine from Andover, uh, Bruce McWilliams, got into a terrible car accident after their second year at Cornell and changed David's life and Bruce's life forever. Bruce was planning on being president of the United States, but after this car crash, he gave that up. And David really was never the same after the car crash, although it, it took him, you know, was, he lived for another 20 years. Um, and uh, you know, that was another incident that really put me on this path to wanting to write this book. Um, so we have another question uh, that uh, refers to the subtitle, Life's Cut Short. And it, the questioner says that this, of course, suggests a sense of destiny unfulfilled and asks, can you talk a little bit about uh, how the deaths of these four men might have changed your own thinking about your life's trajectory and also about how their deaths may have affected other classmates from Andover? That's a very good question. Uh, you know, as far as my own life, um, obviously I decided to make a major change and go from being an investment banker back to being a writer. Um, maybe on some sort of subliminal level uh, that, that the business of existentialism that I was talking about before, the fragility of life uh, made me realize that, okay, 17 years as an investment banker was more than enough, thank you very much, and that I really needed to, you know, follow my passion, my original passion to be a writer, which I got sidetracked on for 17 years. I, I'm not sure that the deaths of these four friends in any, uh, you know, overt uh, conscious way uh, uh, had me make that change, but perhaps on a, on a subliminal uh, uh, way uh, definitely worked on me. Um, and I certainly have no regrets about uh, becoming a writer full time, going back to being a writer, writing books and article, magazine articles and living the life of a writer, which is I'm now coming to the point, by the way, the crossover point where I've been a, a writer as long as I was a banker. So um, uh, that that's sort of a, an important milestone as far as classmates. And I mean, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people were affected by uh, the death of Will Daniel, uh, uh, certainly the way they talked about him and the impact that he had on their lives, even though he was a, he was a very untraditional, he lived a very untraditional, nomadic, singular kind of lonely life. Uh, and of course, you know, I think it kind of goes without saying that John Kennedy's death uh, affected millions of people. Uh, and those people who I spoke to who were especially close to him, uh, you know, were literally sobbing as they were telling me uh, stories, recounting stories of, of, of their interactions with him and, uh, you know, the risks that they thought he was taking by piloting his own plane and uh, were, were incredibly, I mean, I, of course, I expected you know, uh, Jack Berman's wife and Harry Bull's wife to be extremely emotional and, and moved by the recollection of the, the deaths of their husbands. But uh, I was incredibly uh, amazed by, I mean, you know, I, I remember exactly where I was when John, John died too. Uh, I would happen to be right where I am now, but uh, you know, I'd come back from a run and, you know, it was a beautiful July day. Uh, and, and, you know, CNN was flashing the news that his plane had gone missing. But I mean, you know, and it affected me, obviously, uh, and it moved me. But, you know, the people I talked to who, you know, maintained their friendships, and he was a hard guy to maintain friendships with because everybody wanted a piece of him. But there were, there were people who managed to do it. And, and their 
recounting of that to me was so emotional for them. It was really quite amazing. I'd like to ask you to generalize a bit in, in terms of um, how a person's response to profound loss like this takes the measure of them. I mean, do, 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 you, do you subscribe to that, that idea that the measure of a man or a woman uh, can be found in the response to severe, unexpected, profound loss? I mean, uh, I think if you are at all have any humanity, it has to affect you in a very deep and personal way. I mean, uh, you know, not good. I've been fortunate in my own life where I've not really experienced that in my own family per se. Uh, again, I spoke about my first cousins who I really didn't know all that well and not good. My parents are still alive. Um, uh, but you know, I, you know, I could feel when Joe was talking about, I mean, you know, how, how do you experience something that Joe Luzzi experienced and not be profoundly changed by it, which obviously he was. Uh, and and um, that is, you know, absolutely clear. But I, you know, as I started this conversation, uh, you know, my coming to this topic was much less of a direct line. It was more zigzagging and internalizing these, these losses and internalizing the, the, the sort of uh, existential philosophy about how important it is to try anyway to you know live your life to its fullest because you know at the end of the day you know uh, you know no one gets out alive is a phrase that I used often in my other books about Wall Street is something de Gaulle said which is that the graveyards are filled with indispensable men you know the graveyards are filled with indispensable men so we may seem so important, but the truth is we're not that important. And it really is, as a result, important to be kind and open and sensitive and, and you know, be good to each other, something we have a lot of trouble doing. And has the completion of this book given you a sense of closure? Has the process of writing the book contributed to a sense of closure regarding these tragedies? On this topic, yes. I don't, uh, I mean, e each of the books I've written, uh, you know, has given me a sense of closure on that topic. You know, I, I, you know, there are many people who would like to relitigate with me what happened in the Duke lacrosse scandal. I will not be doing that. Uh, I don't feel the need to uh, re-examine, you know, the Lazard uh, that I wrote about, that I stopped writing about, you know, 14 years ago. I mean, I'm quite knowledgeable about these topics. I'm happy to discuss them. But, uh, you know, I think once you write a book, that's it. It sort of has to live on its own. Uh, uh, and and I feel, you know, cleansed of that passion that I initially had when I decided to write uh, the book, um, you know. No sequels for any of these books. Well, thank you very much, William Cohen, for a very stimulating and, and a very deep conversation. We appreciate it immensely. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Please join us next week, Wednesday, May 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, where Cara Robertson will be talking about the trials of Lizzie Borden. If you'd like to learn more about the National Humanities Center, our mission and our programs, please go to our website at nationalhumanitiescenter.org. I'm Robert Newman. Be safe and be well. Thank you very much.